expect the left turn and welcome back to the Jack's Left channel and welcome back to our special series on Jacksonville's consolidated government. In parts one and parts two, we looked at Jacksonville after World War II and we looked at the 1950s and the 1960s and all the different things that were going on in Jacksonville during that time that led up to the formation of Jacksonville's consolidated government, which began, the consolidated government began on October the 1st, 1968. And I want to talk about the years after 1968. I want to talk about the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, and the first 14 years of the 21st century here in Jacksonville. There's a lot that's happened as a result of, of, of Jacksonville coming together, of bringing the county and the city government together. I want to bring it all together in this part three, and then we'll talk about what's down the road on part four. So, in 1968, uh, there was uh, the consolidated government with the new mayor, Hans Tanzler, city council, and uh, Hans Tanzler hired the uh, director uh, of the, uh, the study commission, the executive director of the study commission that helped bring about the consolidated government. The man that uh, Hans Tanzler hired to be the first, essentially, chief administrative officer of the new consolidated government was a man named Lex Hester. And he had uh, uh, been uh, in Jacksonville. He had been uh, working in the U.S. Labor Department as a uh, wage uh, investigator, uh, and uh, so he uh, had a part in the uh, study commission as an executive director and helped bring about the the uh, study, the uh, blueprint for improvement study that I talked about in part two. And so it's 1968. The people of Jacksonville had voted to consolidate with the beaches having their own governments and Baldwin having their own government. Uh, and then working through local uh, service agreements. But other than that, the city and the county came together and, uh, you know, things were, were different. Uh, in 1968, what we see behind us uh, didn't exist. At least some of the buildings on the riverfront didn't exist. In 1968, we didn't have the Wells Fargo building. It wouldn't uh, come into being until it became, uh, it was built in 1974 as the Independent Life Building. The land it was put about to later. The the skyscrapers you see here didn't exist. Uh, now, of course, there was the, uh, the American Heritage Large Building at, uh, towards the, uh, just beyond the Main Street Bridge. Uh, and, uh, but what we see now uh, wasn't all that, you know, wasn't there. Uh, not all that was there. Uh, we had, uh, of course, the Main Street Bridge, of course, built in 1941. Uh, was there. We had the old uh, city hall that was the current city hall at the time. Uh, and then you know, the landscape changed. But a lot of this was brought about by powerful mayors uh, and powerful initiatives uh, to, to revitalize downtown. Because what was happening was that in the late 1960s, early 1970s, the malls came to Jacksonville. We see Square Mall in 1966, 67, in that time frame, as well as uh, the Normandy Mall on the west side, the Roosevelt Mall, uh, the Phillips Mall on the south side, all these different malls. So people were starting to do more shopping outside downtown. And Jacksonville was growing exponentially in the 1970s and the 1980s. And uh, I was born in 75. And in the early, late 70s, early 80s, I can remember, still remember horses in the Mandarin area. But the horses would go away and the apartment complexes and single family homes would really come into Mandarin. So what would start to happen is we would start to see a lot more, even more development, even more development than what I talked about in parts one and two, uh, development uh, out in the, out in the outside uh, 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 the downtown inner city Jacksonville. So there was a whole new set of challenges that the government had to deal with. Uh, so. What was beginning to happen was, first of all, after the government was actually brought together, uh, Lex Hester had a reputation as a chief administrative officer of uh, professional hiring. And a lot of the things that I talked about in part two, the cronyism, the, the I, scratch, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, some of the different rigging of the contracts, those kinds of things, that started to go away and we started to begin to see a uh, professionalism of the local government. So we saw that starting to happen in the late 60s, early 70s. There was a lot of reform efforts, a lot of changes. Uh, there was a judicial reform that was happening uh, that, that, that changed in the early 70s. So all this started to happen. 
And so uh, later on, Hans Tanzler uh, went to run for governor of Florida. Uh, and so uh, at, after uh, Hans Tanzler decided he wanted to run for governor, uh, Jake Godbold, city council president, was appointed uh, for a period of time as the mayor of Jacksonville. And then he was elected uh, and served two terms. And I want to talk about each of the mayors because what we really saw as a result of the consolidation of the government was a powerful administration, a powerful mayor, and also from time to time coordination with all the different groups, uh, civic groups, business groups, uh, uh, professional groups, uh, political groups, uh, and some people concerned about certain issues. Even today, a lot of people are specifically concerned about one or two issues. Some people are concerned about revitalization of downtown. Others are concerned about sprawl and transportation and, and growth in that area. And some people are concerned about specific issues, social justice issues, the economy, all these different things that are going on uh, that, that, that are a part of the problems and the complexities of the big city that we live in. And so future mayors, after Hans Tanzler, were having to deal with the growth that was occurring outside downtown, out along the interstates, I-295 and I-95, and uh, we're having to figure out what to do about trying to promote downtown so that there's a center to the whole, the whole that is Duval County, Jacksonville. So Jake Godbold, was involved in a lot of different efforts to bring federal money into the city of Jacksonville. He helped in the uh, getting the Skyway Express constructed. He started in getting the construction of the Jacksonville Landing. Uh, and I attended the opening, the first opening weeks, I wasn't there the first day, but within the first week or two, my family and I, as uh, uh, 11, 12 years old, came on down to the landing one night, and uh, quite, quite an amazing time. Uh, back then, there was a Banana Republic, a Sharper Image store, some really nice restaurants, a great time uh, in the late 80s. So there's a lot of an effort to get development out here along the riverfront. And so Jake Godbold was really, that was his legacy, uh, to, to try to really get as much uh, development uh, in the river, uh, on the riverfront as possible. And so, of course, there was also, during that time, uh, the effort to uh, develop the riverfront on the South Bank. Uh, as well as on the north bank. So uh, I'm here on the south bank enjoying uh, what has ultimately resulted. Uh, so then we then there was a big issue, and this big issue was the first issue I became aware of uh, as a youngster growing up here in Jacksonville. It was something I faced, uh, and uh, it was something that actually uh, was something that was a campaign issue. And ultimately, uh, a campaign promise was made and a promise was kept when Tommy Hazuri uh, became mayor of Jacksonville. He bulldozed uh, the uh, toll plazas off the uh, off I-95 and off the uh, Wellington Expressway uh, and uh, going over the Matthews Bridge. And so that also helped too, where people could be uh, have the opportunity to move around Jacksonville without having to pay a toll to go across the bridge. And as a youngster, I remember being on a hot school bus on a hot day. Uh, and uh, having to sit in a traffic jam just behind all the people paying the tolls so I could get to school. Uh, back then, during the desegregation days, uh, I, um, uh, where some of the suburban kids would have to uh, go on to, uh, to downtown uh, to some of the inner city schools. So that was something that I became acutely aware of, the fact that, that uh, Jackson's a very huge place. And so there was, again, continued effort to develop on the riverfront but ultimately, uh, Tommy Missouri didn't get reelected as, uh, as uh, mayor of Jacksonville for a second term. He later went on to uh, serve on the school board. But then along comes Ed Austin. Uh, he was powerful state attorney and quite a mover and shaker, powerful state attorney uh, who ran uh, in uh, 1991. He was elected Democrat. He changed parties to be a Republican. And uh, so he had a lot of uh, an initiative to get the River City Renaissance Program started. That involved uh, getting the bond issue passed uh, through uh, the, the electorate, the voters of Jacksonville voted for this program that uh, involved the uh, uh, expansion of the, uh, of the, uh, the Gator Bowl uh, and also uh, involved uh, the renovation of the what was called the Civic Auditorium, which is now the Times Union Center for Performing Arts, again, out on the river, and 
And so there was all this effort, uh, once again, to build uh, and really develop uh, downtown and also to do more to make Jacksonville attractive to people to, to visit uh, and also to work. So then uh, with, with all that effort, uh, along comes now John Delaney. And so he implements this River City Renaissance program. Uh, and uh, so as we look at it over the past years, we've seen a lot of initiatives for uh, you know, uh, Mayor Godbold, got the Randy uh, started. He also got the Convention Center going. Ed Austin brought about the River City Renaissance. John Delaney implemented the River City Renaissance. And, and throughout all of this time, there was effort to bring an NFL team here to Jacksonville, starting with Jake Godball, trying to bring the Indianapolis Colts uh, here. Uh, and then there was talk that the Houston Oilers would come here. Uh, back when it was Houston, there was a Houston Oilers. Uh, so uh, uh, there was all of this talk, and uh, Mayor Zuri had tried to, to do it. And Austin finally, along with a uh, group of folks, again, a, a group that formed a single issue to get a team here, we finally brought uh, an expansion team here. We got an expansion team. We know them as the Jacksonville Jaguars. We got them uh, where the first game was played in uh, 1995, in August of, uh, in the month of August of 1995. So uh, again, there's a lot of effort to get notoriety, to get attention on Jacksonville. We had the Super Bowl in 2005. Now, uh, John Payton comes along and is known for, is known for his early literacy uh, program uh, and, uh, and also in really getting things going with the Better Jacksonville Plan that resulted in the construction of the, uh, of the new courthouse. So we see in a lot of that the idea that when, when Jacksonville chooses to uh, uh, come around a certain issue, a certain development, a certain thing, we have been able to coordinate over the years to coordinate to get that to happen. The question is, what we bring, what we develop, what we build, doesn't have a lasting impact on the city. I can say certainly with the Riverfront projects that the Riverfront sure looks beautiful today. But are we getting the thriving type development uh, that we'd like to see? Uh, and that's the question that I ask. And there's always that hole in the talk between downtown and the suburbs and what goes on out in the suburbs. Is my road 10, 15 miles west of here, paved like it should be? But also, do I have the option on a Saturday, Sunday, can I come down here and enjoy what all Jacksonville has to offer? So there is that, that, that back and forth. And that is a struggle that I think that we face. So, We've had this mechanism for things to be coordinated. But the question also comes back to who do we elect as mayor? Who do we elect as council? And then we have our current mayor, Mayor Alvin Brown, elected in 2011, Jacksonville's first African-American mayor uh, elected. And uh, he's been working on dealing with the problem of the overburdened, underfunded uh, police and fire pension. And that's taken a lot of its attention uh, as mayor and also to try to work on development at the port. And also with one spark, developing one spark to really get people down here, downtown to see what there is out there uh, for people to enjoy uh, on a daily basis. So uh, there's a lot, a lot of challenges. And the question will be, what direction does Jacksonville take in 2015? Uh, there's a lot that Jacksonville has going for it, but there are also challenges and struggles and problems. And I'll talk about that more also in part four. So coming up now, uh, we're waiting on the Jacksonville Consolidation Task Force to, uh, to determine what recommendations that they want to provide to the City Council. So uh, by the end of April, they're going to have these recommendations. And I'm going to talk about these recommendations with you. And we'll talk about the challenges we face and whether I think that these recommendations are going to have the uh, ability to take Jacksonville where it needs to be in the next 10, 15, 20 to 30 years. Uh, a lot i talked about today, a lot to think about. Uh, and when I stand out here on the riverfront with this water taxi going across and these beautiful skyscrapers and the Main Street Bridge on a beautiful day, a beautiful March day in 2014, I guess today I really ask you the question, what, we, what can we do uh, as people of Jacksonville to bring about the talent that we have in all the different progressive groups 
into making downtown Jacksonville and all of Jacksonville throughout Duval County a better place, a thriving place where people can have a good job, can work hard, uh, make the money that, that can support being able to enjoy uh, enjoy what all that the city has to offer, be it beaches, the riverfront, uh, and elsewhere throughout. So uh, I guess I'll end it on this note. We've heard that phrase, size matters. And you know what? Size does. But I think that as we approach these recommendations coming from the, uh, the Consolidated uh, Government Task Force, one thing to keep in mind is that in many ways, the size is our strength. The ability for us all to come together as one in the city council with certain deficiencies coming out of the council because what we get is what we get when we vote for these people. But ultimately, I think we come to the point where we, we have the ability, the numbers, and in many ways still the money, the capability to take the energy and, and drive something really big and really great. So uh, something to think about. Tell me what you think. Please check out uh, Jacksonville Perspectives on Facebook, uh, the Jacksonville Public Affairs channel on Facebook. And you know, there's always our website, www.theleftturnnetwork.com, where, where everything is, and you can really enjoy it. There's a lot more to come here on the Jacksonville channel. Who runs Jacksonville? Future episodes of History Jacksonville. I on the Jacksonville City Council, and you know what? I know it's March 2014, but I get this feeling that the mayoral election of 2015, city council election of 2015, are really not that far away. And you know what? I'm going to be deep into it. So take it easy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me today. See you later.